Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we have our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news about COVID-19 with AMA's Chief Health and Science Officer, Dr. Mira Irons in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Irons, uh, today is a sad milestone. Uh, we have crossed a threshold that I didn't think we would see, uh, 500,000 deaths from COVID-19. Can you share some perspective on that number? So, you know, as you say, Todd, it really is a grim milestone. Never thought I'd see this. I don't think any of us thought we would see this. Um, you know, just to give you some perspective, um, a month ago, January 19th, we were talking about the grim milestone of 400,000 deaths. Um, and it's been roughly one year since the first known coronavirus related death was reported in the US. No other country has counted so many deaths in the pandemic. More Americans have died from COVID-19 than on the battlefields of World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined. Um, it's the, the, the impact is a bit different depending on where you are in the country. If you look at the US as a whole, about one in 670 Americans has died of it. That percentage is higher in many areas. New York City, we're looking at a figure of about one in 295 people. LA County, one in 500 people. And in Lamb County, Texas, one in 163 people. You know, a few public health experts predicted we'd see a death toll of this magnitude. You know, you might remember um, going back to the White House press briefing on March 31st when Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burke, Burks announced um, what we thought then was a stunning projection that as much that as many as 240,000 Americans um, might die from this. And here we are, less than a year later, the virus has killed more than twice that number. However, um, this really sad milestone does come at a hopeful moment. New virus cases are down sharply, um, deaths are slowing, and vaccines are steadily being administered. Um, you know, over the past week, there's been an average of 66,393 cases per day. Um, and although that's a decrease of 44% from the average two weeks ago, that's still a lot of new cases um, per day. And so um, while I think we can look at that in a positive way, um, we still need um, to double down and, and know that this is we're, we're in a, a serious um, pandemic. Yes, we had uh, Dr. Tom Frieden, the former director of the CDC on the COVID-19 update uh, on Friday. And he mentioned it seems kind of where we've come inured to these numbers. Uh, you mentioned before, we never thought we would see even 250,000. Now we're at 500,000. And even that kind of caseload a day, you know, almost 67,000. One of the things I asked him is, you know, what, what is that caseload where the American kind of public health infrastructure can, you know, do its job in terms of contact tracing and everything else? And his number was 15,000. Right. Which is stunningly low comparison to what we've been seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, you need to have a low enough community spread across the country in order um, to to be able to, to follow up on these cases and to contact tra trace. But if you have high levels of community spread, then it's more likely um, that um, the virus will, you know, be transmitted from one person to the next. Is his counsel when we looked at the positivity rates and the, just a level here in Cook County, uh, yeah. where Chicago is, his interpretation was, you know, it's not safe to go, you know, to do all those things or to pull back. Uh, right. So we have to do recognize that even though the numbers have fallen, it's still at an extremely high level. Absolutely. So if, if you look at uh, on a state by state basis, are you seeing kind of any trends emerging on where we are right now? Yeah, I think, you know, the trends that we're seeing now is that as of Friday, the 11 states with the highest rates of recent cases all border the Atlantic Ocean. Um, New York and New Jersey are adding cases at rates that are higher than any state except South Carolina. Um, though case numbers have fallen somewhat in South Carolina, the Spartanburg, Gaffney, and Orangeburg areas still have some of the worst outbreaks in the country. Um, and highly infectious variants continue to merge across the country, potentially undermining some of the progress of the last month. Um, and even though the federal government um, through the CDC is ramping up tracking efforts for these variants with genomic surveillance, surveillance, the pervasiveness of those variants still remains largely unclear. We're just getting a handle on this now. So it becomes even more pressure for the vaccine rollout to gain traction. Can you talk about, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the latest 
uh, findings on the uh, vaccines and particularly on their effects, uh, the, the effects of the variant. So, um, you know, I think that um, there are a few new studies have come out and on all of these are on, on preprint servers right now. Um, so there we haven't I haven't seen anything peer reviewed that suggests that one shot of a vaccine um, can greatly amplify the antibody levels in those who have recovered from the coronavirus, almost like a booster um, in those that have already had it. Um, and so I think we're going to hear a little more about that um, in the coming months. Um, I can I can say that the the CDC and ASAP have not taken um, taken that up at least uh, publicly. Um, you know we have heard from both the FDA and the and the CDC that you know the at least the two dose vaccines. You know the large clinical trials that we have um, have studied two doses. Um, so that deviating from that. Um, without a lot of evidence um, is is still um, is still difficult, and we'll see where the discussion goes and where um, the new um, uh, we'll, we'll see you know what the peer reviewed literature shows on this. Um, the um, new vaccine news this week is that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is a single dose vaccine on an adenoviral vec uh, platform, um, the is being discussed at the FDA on Friday. The external advisory committee is meeting to discuss that application for EUA. The um, uh, the 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 documents for that meeting generally become public and are posted on the FDA website two days ahead of time. So we should have more information and, and more data um, that we can review on Wednesday. Um, the meeting is all day on Friday. And then uh, we would expect that ASIP, which is the CDC External Advisory Committee, um, will likely meet over the weekend and into the early part of next week um, if they use the same procedure that they used for the prior two vaccines. All right. Well, it seemed like our vaccine distribution efforts were uh, mm -hmm. kind of cranking up. We'd reached the levels of about 1.7 million vaccines per week, but then it seems like Mother Nature dealt us a little blow last week. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, um, as 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 if supply is an doesn't continue to be a problem. Um, the weather-related delays really hit the country hard in terms of distribution. Um, the White House estimated that the weather had created a backlog of 6 million doses. Um, Andy Slavitt, uh, a White House pandemic advisor, said at a news conference on Friday morning that those doses represented about three days' worth of shipping delays. Um, and the bad weather you know, slowed two vaccine shipping hubs, a FedEx center in Memphis and a UPS site in Louisville. Um, and FEMA said that more than 2,000 vaccine sites were in areas with power outages last week. Um, shipping delays were reported in multiple states. Um, obviously, you know, everyone's heard about how, how hard things have been in Texas, um, but in Texas, where millions of residents lost power during the past week's powerful storm, state health officials said that hundreds of thousands of first and second doses that were supposed to be delivered were still waiting to be shipped. Um, so if you look at the numbers this week, the CDC reported on Saturday that more than 61 million doses had been administered, including about 42.8 million people who received at least one dose and about 17.9 million people who have been fully vaccinated. Excellent. Well, this week, the FDA also released some recommendations for vaccine development in response to the variants, which you mentioned earlier. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, so on Monday, um, the FDA um, released some information um, to help guide vaccine developers who are developing, who are tweaking their vaccines um, for um, to to better uh, to have better efficacy against future variants. You know, one of the questions that has come up is whether any any change to the vaccines that are currently used will have to go through the same large trials um, that ha that have gotten us to this point. And what the FDA said was that the developers would not need to conduct lengthy randomized control trials to evaluate vaccines that have been adapted um, to target new variants. So what the recommendations are calling for are small trials, um, more like what's required for the annual flu vaccine, um, would greatly accelerate the review process at a time when scientists are increasingly becoming anxious about how the variants might slow or reverse progress. Um, the 
that, that guidance was part of a uh, slate of new documents the agency released on Monday, including others addressing how antibody treatments and diagnostic tests might need to be retooled to respond to um, virus variants. Well, that's good news. I remember when uh, Dr. Paul Offit was on here several weeks ago, we asked him that question about, you know, how long does it take to adjust uh, for these kinds of variants? And he said the actual process of doing that is rather short. It's the production and distribution part that's the hard part. And if you don't have to go back through these right. large-scale tests, that's good news yep. uh, as well. Well, finally, are there any key messages that the AMA uh, would uh, like people to know this week? Uh, there are two. Um, so last Thursday, leading business and nonprofit organizations, including the AMA, launched the Health Action Alliance to strengthen and accelerate the business community's response to COVID-19. Um, this alliance will empower a network of businesses to improve the health of employees and communities by promoting COVID-19 prevention and vaccine education and strengthen public health infrastructure to be better prepared in the future. Um, the alliance will also work to advance health equity by addressing the needs of disproportionately affected communities. And on Sunday, in response to the passing of half a million COVID-19 deaths, the AMA, AHA, and ANA urge the public to continue wearing masks, practicing physical distancing, and washing hands, as well as obtaining a vaccine when the time comes. Um, to read from the statement, in just three months, the the number of Americans who have died of COVID-19 has doubled. We urge you to remain vigilant in taking precautions to limit the spread of COVID-19. With new, more contagious variants of the virus circulating through the U.S., now is not the time to let your guard down and scale back on the measures that we know will work to prevent further illness and deaths, wearing masks, practicing physical distancing, and washing hands. There's also hope for the future, as millions of people across the country are getting vaccinated and additional vaccines are on the way. We encourage everyone to get the COVID-19 vaccine when it's your turn. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Irons, for this week's update. We'll be back with another COVID-19 update segment tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for listening. Please take care.